Welcome to Season 2 of You and Me Kid, a podcast about starting and raising a family on your own, where I speak with other single moms, those still considering, and experts in relevant fields to give you a real sense of what the day-to-day experience of solo parenting looks and feels like. So wherever you are in the process, I hope this podcast provides some support, helpful info, and most importantly, humor. Thanks so much for listening. Now let's get to it. Today on the podcast, I'm talking to my friend Annalise, who I'm so happy lives here in Colorado with me. Annalise is one of the only female founders in the ski industry, and she's 20 plus years into running the company that she founded. Annalise entered single motherhood a little bit by surprise, but has absolutely found her groove with her amazing little boy Jack, who is very close in age to my daughter Ellie. Annalise and I talk about creating space for yourself after becoming a parent, how to manage the life before and the life after. And we also really talk about what we expected versus the realities of raising a baby on our own, as well as the possibilities of partnership and what dating and creating healthy relationships as single mothers really looks and feels like. I adore Annalise, and I hope you enjoy our discussion. Thank you for chatting on the podcast. I think it's so funny that we reconnected because of the podcast because you and I worked together in the same office building. I don't even know. Is it it might be 10 years ago at this point when I moved from yeah. Jacksonville to Denver and was in PR and and I was in the outdoor industry. You were in the ski industry. We shared the same office building. And I remember so clearly thinking you were the coolest. Just because like, for a number of reasons, like I was in awe that you were in the role that you're in and and I want you to talk about that a little bit, but also that you were in this like male dominated ski industry and you were just this like ray of sunshine <laughs> walking around the office always like you weren't a scary, intimidating, like alpha female. <laughs> you were a total boss in your job, but really I felt like just easy to be around. So anyway, I love that we've reconnected because of the podcast oh. and that people recommended the podcast to you not knowing we knew each other and that has been our way of reconnecting so um that's my long way of saying thanks for chatting today yeah thanks for having me i feel the same i'm so glad we reconnected and also love the way we reconnected it's fun when full circles come back around so yeah okay so just to start typically i start with kind of the background of of why folks decided to or became single moms But I do want to back up just a little bit to how we met because, Annalise, you have a very, I think, unique position in a, for the most part, male-dominated industry. And so would you mind sharing kind of what you do, the company that you work for, um, and then just a little bit about how being a single mom in that world, um, yeah, went? Yes. (laughs) So I am um, co-founder and current CEO of Icelandic Skis, a ski company based here in Colorado. You know, it was, it was started by myself and three friends that we've all known each other since middle school. So super tight group of people. It's since expanded and evolved, obviously. Yeah, I've been at this for, I mean, almost 20 years, basically, which is wild. I think the company has officially been operating for 17 years, but we've all kind of been working on it for longer. So in that time, I have held all the positions in the com- company and have, yeah, experienced quite a bit in a very male-dominated industry, as you as you said. And I've been on boards and held different positions within the industry, both ski and outdoor. And I'm just coming off of a full year sabbatical, so I've actually had some good time to reflect on what that all means. Yeah, it's been a spiritual journey for me in general, just... It's been a path of sort of self-realization and of kind of stepping into my purpose and power. And it's been, yeah, just I so invaluable for me becoming who I am. I mean, are there any other female ski company founders? There are now. There's Coalition Snow. I don't oh, yeah. know if you've heard of them, but um, that's a full female and snowboard manufacturing company. So I think they're like five years old or something. But other than Donna Burton from Burton Snowboards, she was the CEO of Burton for a while. But no, it was her and I 
we're the only like female CEOs in the hard goods industry for a long so well time. Well over so, a decade. Pushing almost Oh, yeah. Decades. That's incredible. Yeah, totally. So I didn't ever have anyone to look up to or, or anything. So I definitely forged my own path, which I think I would have done man or woman. You know, that's kind of my personality. But um, yeah, it's been been wild and that's like a whole separate conversation podcast do you think being the but, founder of the company you know obviously being a woman in a male-dominated industry is a battle in its own right that i'm sure you've you've gone up and down and left and right with for now two decades but then becoming a mom let alone a single mom is kind of a new conversation that you might be having with your colleagues. But since you're the founder and your co-founders are such close friends of yours, do you feel like that allowed you to kind of carve whatever path you needed in terms of time off and rest or instead of like fighting HR or creating a maternity leave policy or something like, you know, some of the gals I've interviewed have had to do? Yeah. And for that, I feel so blessed. It's it's funny. So the first child came into Icelandic 12 years ago, and that was our artist, Travis Parr. He was the first person to have a baby in the company. And he's kind of contracted work anyway, so we didn't even consider um, like a parental leave policy or anything when that happened because he kind of works on his own schedule. So that that was the first baby, but we didn't like think about any sort of policy. And then just within the last couple of years, we've had six babies at Icelandic throughout the company. My, I was actually the second to last. So we had started creating parental leave policy and maternity leave policy and things like that. And we're we're now B Corp. So that's all required in the, you know, in the becoming of that. So we had been developing, you know, policies and standards around this anyways. But yeah, when I when I uh, became pregnant and um, was taking some time off, yeah, I I mean, I just feel lucky in general with the position that I have that I can work with my coworkers to create whatever situation is best for all of us. And there's no kind of one standard, you know, one size fits all situation for us. And it's been cool. We've all kind of taken different approaches to what we need, like men, women, yeah, mothers, fathers, whatever. So it's been, yeah, it's been cool. And I've gotten to really craft the situation that works best for me. And I just feel so lucky about that. Yeah, you said you took a year off. So how old is your baby now? Tomorrow, he's a year. Oh my gosh. I That's know. A big milestone. Yeah. How really are big you milestone. feeling about a year? really crazy. I'm definitely reflecting like a year ago exactly today is when I started going into labor, like my water had broke, but no contractions yet. So yeah, the past 24 hours, I've just been in this really sort of liminal space of reflecting on a year ago and telling Jack the story of his birth. And the weather is like pretty similar to what it was last year. And yeah. Yeah. It's wild. I can't believe a year has passed already. It goes so fast. It's so cliche, but it does oh. go so fast. Oh, um, wild. Okay. Let's back up just a little bit so that folks listening know what I know in terms of kind of your path to single motherhood. So how did it happen? How did you make the decision? Give us kind of the, how how you ended up being a single mama story. Yeah. Great question. Because there's so many ways to become a single mom, right? Um, and I loved listening to your podcast and hearing all the different stories. So my path, I think it really did kind of start with the decision to take a year off from work because I was like really burnt out and just felt like I needed a big change in my life. And I had just gone through a big breakup and was just kind of dark night of the soul. And I was like, okay, I need to change. Like I need to shake things up. So I proposed a sabbatical to my board and got that approved. And long story short, on the very first day of my sabbatical, which was January 17th of 2022, is when I took a pregnancy test and found out I was pregnant. So, and that was a 
big surprise and not intentional at all. I was casually dating somebody and yeah, you know, the little miracle came through and I didn't not want a child, but that was not how I wanted it to happen if I were to, you know, have a kid. So, but full disclosure, this was the third time that I had gotten pregnant and it was just, it, yeah, something about it felt different. I mean, obviously I was, you know, older and the whole time in planning for my sabbatical and my time off, I didn't necessarily have a plan for what I was going to do, but I had an intention for for receiving a new inspiration in life. <laughs> it was like I was just praying to open to the new people and opportunities that would herald in the next chapter. That was like my mantra, just like, Oh my God. Whatever. I'm careful what you wish for. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I know I get chills thinking about that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that little (laughs) gift came and I was freaked out. I was like, this is not what I wanted. Or, you know, I, this is, this is not what I thought was going to happen. And so I was really freaked out for, you know, the, for a while. And I debated terminating it again. And, you know, I went back and forth, back and forth for basically eight weeks. I gave myself two months to kind of like make the decision or come to clarity. And I, in that time, I, I talked to as many people as I could that would have, that I thought would have some kind of helpful insight. I talked to several friends who are and were single moms I talked to men who had been in similar situations as, you know, the father would be of like not really having a choice and sort of more or less being forced into fatherhood and what that was like for them. So I just like as much as I could, you know, I took in all the information that was available to me um, so that I could maybe distill it into some sort of decision. And then I just prayed and prayed and prayed every single day to for clarity and for the fear to like dissipate, you know, reveal the the right path for me. Then one day it was like coming down to the wire. I won't get too into like the spirituality part of this all, but I had clarity and the clarity was like a full body. Yes, this is absolutely part of your next chapter. This is what you need right now. It was one of the most spiritual experiences I've ever had in just like receiving, you know, like clarity and a message. And then from that day on, I haven't looked back. And it was like all the fear was gone, all of, you know, it just everything. It was just like, yeah, this is this is what I need to do. And so from that moment on, I was like in the conscious place of deciding that I was going to do this and that I was going to do it. Um, I was going to take full responsibility for it, you know, not put any expectations on the man and yeah, just just totally own it. And ownership has been like a very big theme in my life recently. And I have just kind of looked at this as an opportunity to own my actions and my decisions and my future and all of the things. So, yeah. Amazing. Um, I love it. I love that yeah. we're chatting and you're sharing your experience. Cause I think there's, as you said, there's so many paths to becoming a single parent. And a lot of times when you do go down the IVF path, right? Like it's you, you have to be committed to it. There's no necessarily surprise and it's it's this like full on commitment to wanting to be a parent and it, and you have to really hold that as like almost your grounding through the ups and downs of of fertility or adoption or whatever right and so i think it's important to have stories of like it i it wasn't just like you know that feeling all around like there was some uncomfort with and maybe a little bit of grief right to kind of losing maybe that the sabbatical you thought you were going to get oh, yeah. um, versus oh, yeah. the one you got, right? And a lot of mixed emotions with becoming pregnant that we haven't necessarily talked too much about on the podcast. So thanks for sharing, being honest. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for 
having me and sharing this perspective too, because I know that this does happen quite quite a bit. You know, yeah. Too. Oh yeah. And I, yeah. So I love that. Important. So a couple of questions I ask everybody: one, the early days, especially as like if this came a little bit of as a surprise. You had nine months to kind of think about it. When your son did pop into the world, how were those first few months? Um, and what was your support system overall kind of self-support? What did that look like? Ugh. The the birth and the first few months were like just blissful for me. I mean, really intense. The birth was, you know, the most intense experience of my life. But um, I was... I was pretty conscious leading up to the fourth trimester around gathering as much support as I possibly could because because I was alone. Um, luckily, my family lives here all within like 20 minutes of me. So that was huge. And one of my good friends set up a meal train for me. And I don't know if you've read the book, The First 40 Days, hmm. but it's all about the basically the sacredness of the fourth trimester, which is, you know, the first three months after giving birth and how that is just a really important and sacred time to honor yourself as a new mother and the baby. And so I kind of set it up so that I was just basically t like 100% being taken care of for the first three months um, with food and house you know, help and things like that. And my community showed up in ways that I could never imagine. It was so beautiful. Like I got food delivered to my doorstep every other day or every third day. Um, my neighbors all came and like took my trash out. My mom stayed with me pretty much every night, I think for like two or three months. She just lives 20 minutes away, but she'd come at night and make sure, you know, that we were all good and she'd help with Jack in the mornings and stuff. And yeah, so without going into all the details, I was super supported in in the first several months. And it was, I think that that set a really, uh, a really beautiful foundation for motherhood for me. Yeah. Get a couple months in there that it's been pretty, pretty rough, you know, after the, the dream of the first three months. That was my that question. It, yeah. Kind of gets real for sure, but you know, it's learning and like everybody says, everything changes and phases come and go and sorry to, inter sorry to just kind of. No, no, that was, that was my next question was like, okay, when that, when the like honeymoon stage a little bit of like having all of that support and a lot of people that that stage ends very abruptly when going back to work happens, right? Um, and so that's when that real, real life reentry <laughs> happens. Um, some people it's three months, some people it's shorter or longer, but what's your day to day look like now? Like, how do you make it work on the daily in terms of being able to be a professional, being able to be a human and yourself and feeling like you're taken care of? And then great question. And <laughs> our interaction has like, has really inspired me, um, because I'm still figuring it out. I, at first, didn't have any set childcare when I went back back to work. And luckily, I'm very flexible with my work. And I work mainly remote and can do phone calls and meetings and stuff. But I quickly realized that I can't get anything done when I have Jack. It's impossible. He doesn't have a regular nap schedule. So it's just everything is is just unknown, you know, as, as you know, but it was way more intense than I thought in terms of like the not getting, not being able to get anything done. So I flailed for the first few months. Like I could hardly even talk on the phone. It was just insane. So since then I've, I have two days a week of solid childcare. I give Jack to my friend Becca and I'm currently on waiting lists for a few daycares to potentially put him into full-time daycare. And that was honestly, like, when you told me that, like, when you put Ellie into full-time daycare, your life kind of, like, came back and changed in a really good way, that was just inspiring to hear. And, yeah, it helped me 
even consider it because I wasn't even considering it. I was like, no way can I put him into full time. But then having those two days a week are a nice little <laughs> tease of freedom and like having myself again. So anyways, I'm still only two days a week childcare, but in those two days, I get a lot done. It's kind of crazy. Or I get it's nothing incredible, done. incredible, isn't it? It's like it super is incredible. level what I will get done oh. in an hour Dude. after I drop her off. It's, oh, it's, it's insane. absolutely insane. My capability, <laughs> my productivity prior to having a baby versus my productivity knowing I have like two hours without a child oh calling God. on me, it's shocking what I can get done in a wide range of categories <laughs> like shopping, grocery store, work stuff, calls and get my oil changed. Like it's insane oh. what I can do in like <laughs> two hours. It's, it's, yeah, it is so cool. I know. I'm yeah. like, what did I do with my time before this? I I just kind of whittled Move away a lot slower. of time. <laughs> yeah. It's um, crazy. I'm glad that you brought the childcare thing up too, because I think we had such a nice chat about this the other day, but I think I went into having my child into childcare with kind of this outside understanding or pressure or something that I would feel a little bit guilty. There would be like a working mom guilt of dropping my child off at childcare every day. And I would probably be really sad to drop her off because I wouldn't want to spend time with her. And what I've realized is very different, which is A, she loves it. Like that's her party time with her friends, right? Like she's fully engaged and there's art stuff and learning and they're outside and they're in the garden like it's so much more fun for her to be there than just be in our tiny little house like playing with the same toys first off which totally. I didn't totally realize secondly I didn't feel guilt or sadness and I'm completely and totally obsessed with, with my child but I didn't feel sad and I think it was because she loves it there so much and I started to realize she needed that cognitively and socially and developmentally just as much as I needed the time off. And then finally, what I realized too is like my friends that were stay-at-home moms or who are working and having their kids at home, I'm not made of that. Like that is for me 10 times harder than working with a child. Like being a stay-at-home mom, like I at 42, like I don't have that energy I run out of creative ideas to do with my child, especially now that she's moving around. Like, I'm not cut out for it. Like, that takes a step <laughs> so hard. Kind of human. And I think I went in thinking like, oh, I'm going to wish I was with her all the time. And I just don't feel that way. Um, yeah. It was really, really surprising to me. And I think very much against what, like, society tells us. You know, you're going to drop her mm -hmm. off and go to work and – feel guilty and be sad. And I, I just am not. And I get yeah. that time to, I mean, I, we joked about this the other day. It's, I would say 30% of the time I drop her off and I come back and I nap for like yeah. 30 minutes, you know, or I oh, shower eight. and then I start my day, right? Like that thing that I need at baseline, like eat a meal, take a nap, yeah, take a shower. Ugh. It's just so key to me functioning mm -hmm. that now I don't know what I don't know what I would do without it. And I just can't help thinking about my friends with kids of all ages who during COVID just lost oh that. God. Like thought they were in the school zone or the daycare zone and just Ooh. totally lost it. And man, my my like empathy for for I mean moms in general is like now just in a whole different category. But oh yeah. The childcare thing, regardless of of what you decide is the best fit for you, is so key. I don't know, not just for you, but for your kid, I think too. Yeah, you just like re inspired me again because it it is, and like we're not meant to do this alone. And childcare is a form of community. Absolutely, it's pro it's probably more natural for our kids to be in childcare than it is for them to be alone with us. At just like one person every single day my you know sick of me like for sure like she's like oh sick totally of the yeah. toys yeah and the books in our like tiny little house and there's like not a play yeah. room and like a huge yard like we have a tiny tiny little place so it's like she yeah. gets cabin fever and she gets sick of me and I just you know very quickly run out of creative ideas to like come up with oh, yeah. something new to do or go to a new playground so 
it feels really refreshing that there's somebody with fresh energy meeting me at 8 a.m. in the morning to make sure my child is doing all kinds of really fun things (laughs) throughout the day because y'all sure as shit can't come up with all of that. No, that's huge. And then one other thing that I just want to touch on that you said too, that I I hadn't like really realized it because I am, you know, I think the first year, especially and maybe forever, but yes, it's been lots of bliss and, and also like very hard, but in general, I think I've also just kind of been on like a baseline survival mode, (laughs) you know, and the fact, you know, you said sometimes you drop Ellie off and you just go home and take a nap or take a shower or whatever. And I think one of the things we don't realize because we don't have partners in this is that when you're doing it solo, it's like you don't have the opportunity to like take a nap unless they're napping or take a bath or do some, you know, whereas and every every relationship, every family is totally different. So this is not a generalization, or maybe it is. But yeah, we don't, I think maybe in partnerships, you might have more opportunities to like, just take 10 minutes for yourself and like, zone out or whatever. So yeah, yeah, I guess more more for childcare. And like, that's also self care for us. Oh, I guess is my point. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I can't do a lot without it. And I Yeah, I think I'm just really surprised like how much he enjoys it and how much and you know, we talked about this the other day too. I feel like there's like five other people raising my child and I have their insights and expertise and opinions. And especially I mean, I took her at four months and four to six months, like I didn't know that there were different like nipple speeds for bottles. I didn't know (laughs) about that there were nighttime diapers. I didn't know anything. And so to have these amazing you know, teachers kind of say like, hey, Sarah, it's probably time to, you know, switch diapers or it's probably time to get a new bottle for your whatever. Or even this morning I dropped her off and she's still drinking out of a bottle at 15 months. And I was looking around and I noticed she's the only one that's still on the bottle. And I said to the teacher like, hey, you know, I'm trying to get her off of it. You know, can, you, can you help me? You know, Do you have any ideas? And it's so nice to have these women who, um, and men, it's like they they definitely have ideas. They've raised a billion children. Like they yeah. are going to be just these incredible resources for me. And and I couldn't be more grateful for that. Yeah, that's so cool. God, yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. All the, I'll take all the help I can get. You yeah. said earlier, you know, obviously it's been hard. You've got, you're right at this one year anniversary. I'd love to hear from you how it's different than you thought it would be like in those nine months or just your perspective even you know being a little bit older watching your friends have kids or your family have kids what did you think it was going to be like versus what has it been like oh great great question one of my biggest fears about having kids was becoming very isolated kind of being forgotten about sort of, of, I don't know if I'm articulating that, but that was a giant fear of mine. Um, And then just kind of, yeah, like becoming like sort of a nobody, uh, like invisible or something. So that was, that was a big fear of mine. And while it has shifted in ways, like, um, of course, I can't do as much like I can't just go out on a random Tuesday night without thinking about it. And, you know, I'm not as unchained and kind of as free as I I was or had been. I don't feel I almost I feel more seen in some ways and maybe, le- you know, less seen in other ways. Um, I'm trying to articulate it. But yeah, in general, like having having jack has kind of um i am out in the world in a totally new way and it's like such a cool way to meet people and it's such an amazing icebreaker when you have jack because people love interacting with babies and love not everybody but a lot of people do and it's just like such a cool way to connect with people so Maybe I've I've kind of like lost touch with certain people, you know, I mean, my social circle has absolutely changed, but 
if I focus on the ways that I am connecting with people, it's so much richer than I could have ever imagined. Because I was Jack. telling someone the other day, we just went to Jackson Hole for a week and we had a really epic day at the airport. We got stuck on the tarmac for multiple hours. And I was telling someone right. that, again, like what society tells you is like traveling with a baby is going to suck, right? Like that's what you hear. That's what you prepare for. And yeah, sometimes it sucks. But in just the way that you mentioned, I have felt like I connect with people flying and traveling in ways I never, ever would do before because I'd like get on a plane, I'd put my earphones on, maybe I'd take a nap, maybe I'd watch a movie, read a book, but like I'm not engaging. And totally. while yes, it is more stressful, people talk to Ellie. They ask me about Ellie. Like you immediately kind of bond with mm -hmm. the other parents. There's like common jokes that occur. You see each other in the gate. You know, there are people yeah. I have found that the people sitting next to me, if they – our grandparents, if they're teachers, you know, they have some sort of connection to kids or if they just want me to know out of the gate that it's totally okay if I need anything or I just feel like there's this humanity that I would never have seen just as a solo traveler and I really love it. And on this flight, we got stuck on the tarmac for like three, four hours and we were on and off the plane twice. And there were these families of like three, four kids, you know, on their first leg of a long day of travel. And we all just really bonded. Like we ended up spending so much time together at that point. And it, while the stress of having a baby on a plane stuck on the tarmac is high, it completely dissolves the minute you know the people around you don't care if your kid cries, right? Because their kid's going to cry yeah. 10 minutes from now. And an hour from now, we're all going to like deplane and get a glass of wine together. Like it just felt like we were kind of all in it. Oh. Um, I mean, people were like sharing snacks. Like it was very, very cool. Oh. Um, I mean, even even the flight attendants, I've had a handful of flight attendants be like, hey, can I, do you want me to hold your baby while you like get settled in your seat? And it's not just women. And it's, yeah. my answer is yes, a hundred percent yes. I want you to do that. <laughs> like, of course. Yeah. Um, I would oh. love to like get settled and pull my bottle out and whatever. So anyway, I've loved it. It, it The good comes with- oh the stress, I think. Yes. Oh, I got so emotional when you were talking just now because I have seen, I mean, it really, I have seen such beauty and humanity in having little Jack with me. You know, like, I think I told you about like going to our first festival, music festival together and I had Jack the whole time. And I mean, if I had to pee, I would just like literally ask a stranger in front or behind in line or whatever if they would like hold my kid for three minutes while I <laughs> yeah. you know just strangers helping strangers and it's just it's just, and traveling just like your story I and mean, just so many stories like that I just think it's so beautiful and it's I so think beautiful. what I've learned too and I used to do this prior to having a baby was just kind of let you know, if I saw a mom with three kids going through the airport or we were sitting next to each other on the plane, I would immediately say like, hey, if you need anything, just let me know, right? And I have noticed that so much when you have the baby, grandparents, dads, moms, like there are people that know that as long as they just throw that out there, even if you don't need the help, it just immediately takes the weight off. And I've gotten a lot better about saying yes to the help. Um, yeah. At the beginning, I was like, I got it. I got it. I got my system. I'm going to like put the thing on the security thing and roll the stroller and like hold the baby. And now, you know, if there's like some cute dad behind me and he wants to help me put the car seat yeah. on the through the security thing, like, great, done. You know, yeah. please help. Yeah. And I laugh because I've had three just like ridiculously attractive, like smoke show dads help me. <laughs> Through airport security. And of course, they're married, right? I look right at the the ring finger. Um, they're all married, but they're so they they're like so good looking. And I'm keeping up some deep hope that, you know, sometime in the next few months, one of them will be helping me and they won't be married. And they'll be Yeah. So dad, so I'm keeping the hope alive. But I do feel like it, you know, it feels good for them and it feels good for me. And I've gotten way better about accepting that help and it feels really good to do that. Yep. Yeah. People want to help people. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of helping people, I wanted to ask you, you know, we talked a little bit about how it feels different than you thought it would feel. And, and it seems like that overall has been a pretty positive experience for you. 
right now in your one year stage with Jack, what are the biggest challenges you guys are facing as a as a duo and maybe even that you're facing as an individual? I know. I feel like this topic has been pretty rosy and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm digging in well, negative. Yeah, I know. I but one of my friends any big meaty question without any prep. So Yeah, that's you know, great. Apologies for the off the cuff, but what are the things that are feeling really hard to you like right now today? I would probably first of all is um just continuing to find time for myself in terms of I want to get back into my body, you know, and, and establish a regular or like wellness routine, you know, whether that's yoga or whatever that looks like for me right now. I haven't even like tuned in exactly to what I need. But so just finding space and making space for that is I want that to be a priority and that continues to be a challenge for me just because I haven't figured out super regular child care. I guess along that line is um, is social things. You know, I think like I, some of my friends that also have had babies in the past year, like they all just went on like a week long trip and I saw pictures of it and I got a little bit of like FOMO and oh, they all went without babies, without their babies. And it was like an adults only trip, you know, and it looked like so much fun and they're all partnered and you know occasionally like in this moment I got a little down on myself like because they had partners that like took care of the kid you know while the other partner went on this trip or they gave their kid away to their grandparents while they both went on it or whatever so I think I'm struggling with I haven't weaned Jack yet so I'm very much attached we are both very much attached to each other still so I can't leave for like a night at all. And I have had no one else basically ever put Jack to sleep at night. So these types of things are really big challenges for me. Like even the thought of like going away for a night or two without Jack, even though I want I want it to, I just, sorry, I'm, this is off the cuff for me, but that's probably one of my biggest challenges is like, when the fuck am I ever going to like be able to leave for a weekend (laughs) or like uh, I and like how right like what are how is how what are the like levers you need to pull to yeah be like okay because getting someone to watch him isn't the hard part there's these no it's in the middle yes bedtime routine somebody you trust putting yourself in a position where if you do go away you can enjoy yourself and not stress the whole time because you have somebody watching him that you know is like ready to go knows the routine right and then there's all the logistics of like breastfeeding oh and my god so it is it is a lot and i i laugh because i'm totally with you and there's this balance of like i want that like adventure that travel that spontaneity back hmm. but it's funny i feel like I, when given the opportunities, I'm, I would rather hang out with Ellie more than I thought that I would. And when I have traveled without her, I miss her more than I thought that I would. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, mom's gone wild, like baby's at home. Like it is, it was a lot harder for me to be away actually than I really anticipated. Even like, yeah, I was like, let's do this. And then it does kind of hit you. Um, Yeah. But you hit on something that I think is really, really big, which is I assumed because I've been a part of my friends' lives as they've had one baby, two babies, three babies, four babies, et cetera, gotten married, you know, and I think there's this stage where people don't have babies, but they they get, they partner up and then they start going on trips with other, well, first of all, they go on a trip with their partner. So they're traveling and they have this immediate spontaneous adventure buddy, Right. So that's one club. And then those clubs evolve, right? To like, we have a baby, we have a couple babies, and they find different groups of people to hang out with, or they hang out with all your same friends. You're just the one that isn't moving into that stage. Yeah. And so the travel and the adventure part, even if it's like camping like five minutes away when you're not involved has been really hard for me and it I think I just assumed when I had a baby I would be like in the family adventure club 
and get the family adventure invites. And even like my closest friends, like I just have it. And it's not in any way them trying to exclude me. It's because, you know, they meet families through elementary school and they have like a little crew there and we kind of do our own thing together. But recently I've really shifted into the mode of realizing I'm going to have to build that community for myself and coming from having such a strong friend network and support network. I just didn't really, I didn't think I would have to build a new crew. I didn't think that. I thought that my crew existed and I was just going to fold into it, even though our kids are different ages. And I now realize like the, the that that just doesn't make sense. Like if they have 10-year-olds yeah. and I have a one-year-old, we're just in different programs. And that's totally okay. okay. No one's trying to hurt each other. Yeah. But, you know, we're going to the mountains in a week with another mom, you know, and like I'm yeah. so pumped about that. But those are the type of opportunities and activities and travel that I just need to start developing on my own. And I didn't anticipate having to put effort into it. But that's okay. And that's one of the like aha moments I've had in the past six months is that I need to build that for myself and for Ellie. And that's okay. Yes. And I will echo exactly what you said. That that has been something that I wasn't really expecting to. Um, but am now like reconnecting with you really helped spark a lot of this. And and a couple other people that I'm like, oh my God, this is fun. I great i want some new people in my life you know yeah we yeah of course i'm gonna have to build a new community it makes yeah. sense yeah. yeah it absolutely makes sense it just like i grieved it a little bit longer than oh I yeah you should and i yeah. think uh i tried for a really long time to make the old ones work in yeah. this new dynamic and and i've like kind of surrendered to it and i'm feeling just so 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 much better about it the one thing that still does get to me as someone who used to be really spontaneous with like her local adventures and her global adventures is um, is the same kind of grief I had when I was single, which is not having that one go-to person that if you just want to leave on a Friday and you decide at three o'clock that at 3.30 you're going camping oh. or that you're going to buy a last minute flight somewhere you have that partner to do it with, you know, that that was really hard for me as a single person without kids. And it continues to be hard as a single mom, um, except I think it feels a little bit less lonely because I do have a little human with me. <laughs> um, but I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. Like I, you know, the other day I went on a really easy like local hike with Ellie and like 15 minutes and I just pulled her out of the backpack, put her on the ground and she just like crawled into like the water. That's how there was like a very light stream. <laughs> she just like <laughs> crawled in sat in the stream and just like threw pine cones around for 20 minutes. And it just was a really good reminder that like for her, this is a really big adventure. And it was a really nice like hour for me. And it doesn't need to be an international flight. It doesn't need to be something that feels really hard. And I don't have to pull 15 people into it. Um, I don't feel comfortable like camping alone with her yet. Yeah. So there's some things that I think I still need to shift. But yeah, I mean, the the grief of not having that go-to adventure partner is, is going to be their kid or no kid, I think. And and hopefully at some point that role will be filled. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. And I have two things just came to me when you were talking. I love that little simple hike. I've been, I do a lot of that. And, you know, I have a really big, beautiful kind of wild yard. Gnarly and actually just yesterday... Oh God, it's, I know it's such a special place. And just yesterday, I, I, you know, it's constant work to like maintain it, but I love it. And I kind of stopped doing it for the past year because of Jack, but then I started up again because it does make me happy to like maintain this land. I love it. But just working with the earth in whatever way. And yesterday I was like, I got to clean up some of this stuff. And I just asked Jack to help me, you know, and it's what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, life for them is so simple and everything is so amazing. Every single moment of the day for them is something brand new and so cool. And if we can just like, this is so cliche, but slow down and realize that like, it's really beautiful to see life through their eyes and it can bring me and us a new appreciation for what is there. And for some reason that just like really hit me yesterday when it took me like 15 minutes to walk like 
<laughs> 50 feet with Jack carrying a little stick to the fire pit, you know? <laughs> So I was like, oh, this is cool. And I don't need to like go up a 14er tomorrow and, you know, or like, yeah, go on a trip or whatever. It's like it, there is some, some lessons in that for sure. But their life right now is so special. And if we can have gratitude for that, like we do have this awesome little buddy to yeah. adventure with and sure it's not like a lover or partner or whatever but um man is it special and i think the more we can appreciate and recognize and be mindful of that like the more open we will be to whatever is next i'd say like to the thing that i've had to kind of take a moment and recalibrate on is what i needed to feel adventurous and alive and vibrant pre-baby yes it's almost like it's still my brain is still operating in that way. Like what I need is like a big, long day hike or what I need is like to travel or, you know, and I have to really stop and be like, but do I, and is that going to make me feel better? And the time I've had a couple examples of times where I've done a thing that I thought would make me feel really good. That was like kind of part of my old life, like a big fun adventure. And it it doesn't fill the thing that I'm trying to fill, whatever that is. And it doesn't make me feel as vibrant and energized as it did before. And I need to recalibrate to like, okay, what really is going to make me feel good? And maybe it's like getting a massage with a friend. Maybe it's not climbing a 14er. Maybe it's going to the local park with Ellie. Maybe it's something without Ellie. I don't know. Maybe it's a margarita. We went out for margaritas the other day, me and Ellie. Um, We like got on the bike, went and got tacos because I didn't have any groceries. I had a marg. She just like threw tacos around the restaurant for an hour. And I was like, this is awesome. Like we had a little taco date. And it was totally what I needed. And what I was feeling, I what I needed was like, gosh, I wish I were camping tonight with a bunch of friends, right? But that would have been so overwhelming on so many levels. So anyway, just totally recalibrating yep. to what I thought, what I think is going to like fill my cup and what actually might. And they're totally different lists. I love that. I That was part of what I was trying to say. So thanks for articulating that. And And I think that of course, I, I think that we're both still and maybe we always will be. I know I am. I'll just speak for myself, but in a process of releasing and even grieving, you know, the life that we are leaving behind. And that's a totally normal part of becoming a mother is, yeah, is like letting go of what once was and opening to, you know, what is and what will be. And there is grief in that. And there's uh, there's going to be resistance to letting go of a lot of that, too. And Yeah. Yeah. One last question, and I'm also going to throw a big meaty one at you off the cuff. But after being a mama now for one year, what would you say your single mom superpowers are? Ooh. What have you developed in yourself that maybe you didn't quite know you had as one of your superpowers? Wow. <sighs> That's a really great question. Um. What I'm noticing is just my ability to care for people and things. And I'll put this in like a very concrete context. Like my dad actually had a stroke a month ago and he lives 10 minutes from me and we're very close. And so I've essentially been caretaking for him too. And I have two dogs because his dog too and Jack and you know, house and business and everything. But this, and maybe it would have been the same without Jack, but I've just noticed my, I guess I used to have a resistance towards like, it sounds terrible, but like caring for people or like using my time to like help people and stuff. And maybe I was just selfish or who knows, I'm not going to like overanalyze that and I'll just try to keep it simple. But I just feel so much less resistance towards serving or helping people or yeah that's like a weird answer but it's a very visceral thing that I'm noticing in myself of like or like a neighbor needs help or I will kind of like yeah like let down my own needs and not in it it doesn't feel unhealthy but to like help someone else whether that's Jack or a family member or a neighbor or an animal or whatever it just feels like that flows way more naturally for me. So, and that feels like a superpower because it doesn't feel like I'm 
sacrificing. It just feels like I'm doing what needs to be done. And that feels natural. And like, it's this love that was like unlocked in me, you know, the moment I gave birth to Jack, that is just like a universal love. That seems like I'm, (laughs) I love it. Counting myself a little bit big, but it does. It's like this endless supply of like love and care that I have never experienced before. And that absolutely feels like a superpower. Oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry that you're dealing with that with your family, but I'm glad you're feeling like you have a an extra supply of energy and care to, to step yeah. in and support them like they've been doing with you. So, well, I know we're at time. I know you have a um, very busy life as you were just talking about. I just wanted to say thank you so much for chatting. Um, I really appreciate your perspective. I think it's really unique and I just love that we've reconnected and we can have these conversations because I think we've had really fairly similar experiences. And so it's nice to have a buddy through all this. And congrats on one year. You did it. Yeah, you made yeah, it. Thank I hope you, you guys have something know. fun to celebrate together. Yeah, big time. And thank you again for having me. And thank you for this podcast. I just think that this is such an important topic for so many people in general. And um, yeah, I just think you're doing God's work with this podcast. So thanks for having my perspective on. Oh, thanks, buddy. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. For more information about the podcast or me, go to unmekidpod.com. See you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you or your company are looking to jump into the podcast world, now is the time. The Plug Agency is here to connect you to the full power of podcasting. You just record and leave the rest to us. The people are listening and want to hear from you. Theplug-agency.com. That's theplug-agency.com. Click the link in the episode description for an exclusive offer.